Hello and welcome to Exploring Global Problems, a podcast where we talk to academics from Swansea University whose groundbreaking research is tackling global challenges from health innovation to sustainable futures and the environment, digital technologies to clean energy. My name is Sam Blacksland and today I'm joined by Matt Jones, Professor in Computer Science at Swansea University. His research explores digital technology and the global inequalities of access to things we take for granted, such as the internet. He focuses on the divisions technology causes in society, the conflicts between technology and human values, and the challenges from artificial intelligence and big data. In his words, he's challenging the darkness that is descending because of digital. Professor Matt Jones, welcome to Exploring Global Challenges. It's good to see you. Good to be here. Thank you. Um, You describe your research as human-centred computer science. What does that mean? I think when you look at technology, um, we tend to, of course, focus on the shininess. So uh, take your mobile phone out of your pocket and uh, it seems a wonderful, magical um, device. Um, And it is. Um, But I think the most important technology that we have around us are our friends and our families, our uh, colleagues in work, uh, our fellow citizens. So human-centered thinking is saying, okay, we need to think about um, the future and how technologies, digital technologies can help us be better uh, people, be more connected, uh, be more productive. But if we start with the technology, uh, it's well understood and well proven that you might well end up with something that doesn't fit the context or even some of the practical things. So imagine if you designed a system without knowing that half of your users um, had sight impairment. Well, you might put all sorts of amazing, colorful, interesting um, visual um, displays, but half of your users would not be able to use the system. That's an extreme example, hmm. but there are many others. You know, when we pick up a piece of technology, it isn't um, in out of context of, of the rest of our life. Human-centered thinking then is about um, talking to people, understanding what they need of technology, understanding how they physically might use a piece of technology and what they want out of technology and building from the very beginning that into the design. And I think we'll talk um, in some depth about the downsides of technological advances and hopefully also the the positives and the upsides. Mm. But what got you into this research in the first place? What's your background? Oh, that's interesting. So uh, years and years and years and years and years ago, uh, when I was in my, first of all, the undergraduate degree, and then uh, later in postgraduate degree, I, I guess I've always been interested with what technology can do to enhance people's uh, abilities. So I started off thinking about natural language processing, and then I got into um, speech um, recognition when I was doing um, a PhD. Um, but at the end of the PhD, um, I thought, I've had enough of technology, I want to focus on a bit more on higher things and humans. In my last year of the PhD, I um, uh, signed up to become an Anglican priest. Uh, and that was the plan. And I went off after my PhD to a little place in Wales called Welshpool and started as a, um, a lay assistant. Uh, and it was during that time, I suppose, that I began to understand even further the importance of uh, people-centric thinking. You know, any um, faith... It's all about connecting uh, people, their values, with the the wider and bigger picture. Um, For lots of reasons, I ended up not, uh, as you can probably tell, becoming an Anglican priest. I don't know. Um, No, not a priest. Definitely not a priest uh, in the paid sense of the word. Um, And by divine intervention, I ended up, uh, no, literally by divine intervention, I was in Welshpool. I was thinking to myself, maybe I'm not cut out to be a uh, priest of this sort and my tutor from a university was passing through and asked me to come for a pub lunch and as i was sitting with him over a pub lunch he said i don't think god is for you (laughs) which is quite scary isn't it you know so i'm thinking well that's a bit of a because that's the job i've got uh and he said why not apply for this job and it was a job in uh, something called the interaction design center in london i threw off my cv and the next thing i know I'm a lecturer in computer science in that center with a group of people who were um, doing some pioneering work in human-centered um, design. Do you do you ever regret not sticking with that previous um, line of work? I mean, I said I'm not a paid priest. I am a Christian, so uh, I am 
not abandoned my faith. I think in the work we do in universities, there's an element of that kind of pastoral outlook. So, uh, and in terms of understanding and being with people and in my research, I guess I am driven to, to be reminded of the fact that, uh, all of us are very precious and special. And so that even mundane bits of technology that we inflict on people should be, um, aware of that because, you know, it's, it's not easy to make someone like you, you know, you're a special creation. Um, so I feel it's informing my work whether or not I will ever go back into like full-time ministry in the future. I don't know. I'm open to that. So I don't regret it, but I'm open to change. One more philosophical question, perhaps. I mean, a lot of people, I think, see a conflict sometimes between science and religion, although quite a lot of scientists are religious. Yeah. Um, do you think there's a circle that needs to be squared there or, or are the two compatible? I mean, people debate this all the time. Some people really do feel it odd that um, I'm the head of science and um, I say that I'm a Christian. Uh, I think they are separate endeavors. Uh, they put a lens, a different lens on life. So science is about um, truth and finding and uncovering the truth. Faith is about truth and uncovering that truth. But they come from it from different angles. So I think I'm enriched, and anyone who has a, a faith is enriched if they are a scientist. But if you have no faith, then you, know, you are seeking as a scientist uh, insight and truth. And anyone who's guided to find truth and light, we should applaud them, whatever path they take in that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's very interesting. Let's go back to your research. Um, it's taken you many, many places. It's taken you around the world, indeed. Where have you gone and why have you gone there? Well, I don't know, it's sounding like I'm kind of like the uh, Thomas Cook, although that's a little bit... Uh, <laughs> belated. Belated of uh, academia. But yes, I've been really fortunate to, to travel. And most academics travel uh, to international conferences, uh, and I've certainly done that, and to colloquium and workshops around the world. Where I've been really blessed, I think, is um, a lot of our work has been driven by working with, um, well, it all is driven by working with real people in fascinating contexts. Some of those contexts have been in um, the UK, so working in um, rural Wales to understand the needs, for example, of communities that don't have the kind of connections, still don't have the kind of um, 4G or even 3G connections that most of us take for um, granted in big cities. And then much further afield um, over the last 10 to 15 years, intensively engaged in uh, India and um, Southern Africa. So I'll give you an example. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was in Mumbai, massive uh, city, of course, a huge um, uh, business, entrepreneurial, um, thriving um, metropolis. Uh, and we've been working with, um, at the heart of that city, there's a place called Daravi. And if you've um, come across Slumdog Millionaire, uh, that's where it was based and filmed. So it's the largest, I think it still is the largest informal settlement in Asia. Uh, that means over a million people in a fairly cramped setting, doing all sorts of amazing things, um, running business, starting business, making lots of the things that we might wear. Um, or buy uh, in very um, kind of different sort of uh, factories, the ones we might imagine, and then all sorts of commerce going on. And we've been working with communities there to try and understand um, what future technology might look like, not just for them, uh, but also to open our eyes to new perspectives. Such as? Well, just most recently, we've been looking at um, speech assistants. So you've mm. probably come across, you might use you know, Alexa um, or Google Home, um, these um, devices that you place around your home or office and you can ask questions and you'll get uh, occasionally a, a useful answer, <laughs> sometimes a, a strange cackle yes. uh, or a joke. Um, so a few years ago, we were interested in, um, well, what happens if you take those sorts of technology and you put them in the streets rather than in the homes or the offices? Because... Home settings in Daravi are, are very different to ours. You know, they're much more um, cramped and they're, they're shared. So we've put um, speakers, devices we've made um, all across um, Daravi over a couple of years to understand, well, what happens when you do it, when people can just go up and talk to these um, devices. 
and what we can learn from those interactions to inform uh, future design of those technologies for everyone. Um, and it's, you know, it's always eye-opening. You can go to these places and think, well, you know, it's a different context, so you know, maybe it won't work. But you're always surprised by the insights that you get from these forms of interaction. Well, and what was the outcome of this particular trip? Yeah, well, so this particular one, we've been looking at um, uh, comparing the kind of outcomes you get from an artificial intelligence assistant. So you, you talk to the device and you get an immediate response um, in the street uh, with the kind of answers that a human could give. So what we did is design a system that you press a button and you ask your question in Hindi or Marathi uh, or one of the other dialects in that um, in, in the community. It goes off to um, a standard um, uh, assistant, Google in this case, uh, and it will try and answer the question. When the answer comes back, you've got the option of, um, do you want to send this to a human now if you're not happy with the answer? If they say yes, uh, the question gets sent to uh, one of our community in the cr cloud um, answerers. So they've got mobile phones and they've got an app on it and a question will pop up in real time. They will answer the question and that question gets sent back to the box. There's a bit of delay. So then you've got a human answer. And we were seeing the kind of questions that people wanted to refer on to a human also, the difference in the quality of the answer by the human versus the quality of the answer of the machine. In something like 40% um, of the time, people were satisfied with the um, uh, automatic answer. I mean, 60% of the time, they weren't happy um, and they wanted um, help sent back from the human. When they got those answers back from the human, uh, they were much more happy with their, with their answer. And that's not, not really uh, unsurprising. Um, if you sit at home and you feel really happy just talking to uh, a box of a light on the top, then, well, it's unusual. Uh, most people like to engage with real people. And so there's an element of, you know, if you ask, like you're asking me a question, uh, I can engage with it a very different way because I'm an embodied intelligence than a, something that's a, an algorithm. Uh, but there's also the fact that we have a, a connection. So it's not simply that I've got a better understanding of human language and humankind so I can better answer your question. I'm coming to you as a, another human talking and relating on that level rather than a box versus a flesh and blood being. Sure. So I guess this underpins that quote that I started with at the beginning about this descending darkness idea. Uh -huh. But there are a lot of people out there who will see these big technological advances as quite liberating the fact that i've got something in my pocket that means i can get in touch and talk to somebody at the other side of the world rather than I don't know, yeah. sending a letter or visiting them or whatever you know what how do we balance these things yeah i mean there are there's some really good commentators and books john brown is one of them who's um talking um the former head of bp um talking about you know how much progress has happened over the last 10 20 30 years and trying to um fill us all with optimism about the future. Uh, and I, I believe that's right. We should be optimistic because we should be hopeful because we are people and uh, we are able to think creatively and create futures. But there is a lot of worry and it isn't simply you know, me um, trying to have a rhetoric that could sell my book or to get me on to uh, shows or to do um, talks. Um, a lot of people, there have been a lot of surveys by government, non-governmental um, organizations and by media where people have a range of concerns. Uh, you'll be aware of the one where people are worried if you've got friends or family with kids, you know, the amount of time they spend on their mobile devices. Uh, what's interesting there is you know, there's been moral panics for every single new form of technology and media. You know, so when there was radio, people were worried about that. When there was um, uh, films, people were horrified and popular music, you know, rock music yeah. in the 1950s. People, parents, what's it going to do to the moral um, being of our kids in the next generation? What's different now is there's a, a fairly recent survey where um, CNN, I think it was, uh, asked children about their worries. And a large proportion of that big survey said they were worried about their parents' use of technology. 
So whereas in previous moral panics, there's always been grumpy old people like me who look down at the young people like you and say, it's ridiculous, they're wasting their time on these devices. Now we've got young people thinking not only that their own use of technology is perhaps detrimental, but they can see that their parents, you know, sitting at their breakfast tables and in their sitting rooms and looking down in rather than looking in the eyes of their kids and engaging. As one example, there's been reports by Royal Society about um, it's a very interesting one called um, human flourishing and just thinking about the concerns that people have about not just practical things like their jobs, you know, the rise of the robots and how that might take away and change not just uh, manual work or construction work, but even the kind of work that you and I do. Uh, people are worried about that, but they're also worried about the identity uh, philosophical aspects, uh, the questions that the new technology is raising. So I'm not uh, advocating um, a kind of Luddite approach. Sure. Although you'll remember, I hope that you know the original Luddites. They and you, being someone who's interested in history, will know this. Uh, they weren't just smashing technology because they didn't like technology. Their manifest originally, I think, on the front cover said, you know, arising up against a technology that's harmful. Sure. to humanity. So maybe I'm a Luddite, uh, but I do believe that this technology can empower, can amplify if we focus on human capabilities and values and extend them rather than outpace or outsmart um, and try to beat a chess or go and all that. I think that's a distraction. I could see that there would be a lot of sympathy for what you're saying you know, amongst the general public, and you mentioned those, those opinion surveys. What about in your own profession? in the computer science world? Are there people who want a more human aspect in all of this like you, or are you a relatively lone voice? Uh, not at all. No, not at all. So, and I think from a commercial point of view, um, we've just set up a center for doctoral training here uh, at Swansea University. Uh, and over the next nine years, we will be um, building up over 55 uh, new researchers who are going to bring human center perspectives to AI and big data. And the exciting thing is they'll be doing that with a range of partners and stakeholders who are from companies, you know, big ones like Google and Facebook, and then public sector organizations like the NHS, who all realize and embrace the need to build technologies that fit the human context. So it isn't simply a sort of an academic movement that is you know, pushing against the, the, the wave of technology development. I think we are seeing very strong signals that big players, big tech, if you like, is understanding that they, they need to address these concerns, the ethical concerns, the privacy concerns, the security concerns, and that will be done uh, through regulation or through just the market. But going beyond that to see, actually, the most important thing here is the, the person and how we can work with that person and um, technology. There are many researchers around the world, and going back to your question, um, in academia, there's a big field called human-computer interaction. It's been going for 40 plus years, and it's always been driven with at whatever stage of development technology that we understand the human um, context. Uh, so it's a, it's a worldwide wide endeavor. It's very multidisciplinary. So comp computational scientists like me are involved, psychologists, sociologists, ethnomethodologists, historians, all sorts, geographers. And, you know, that has enriched, I think, and got into many products over the last uh, 30 years. So there's, a, there's a definitely a, a movement there, and uh, we'd encourage more people to join it. What are your views about these big companies that you mentioned? Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the, their attitude to all of this? Because you, you mentioned Alexa earlier. Yeah. And one of my concerns when I speak to an Alexa is I think it's listening to me, and by extension, the company is listening to me. And there's, there's a lot of privacy yeah, issues surrounding yeah, all of yeah. this, isn't there? That's a really interesting point, actually. And, and going back to what we were saying about um, smart speakers understanding the human versus the computer help. Mm -hmm. Recently, there's been a lot of worry that um, Facebook and Amazon and Google are listening to your queries, and they are, and they were admitted that. So what they do is, when you ask a question to your Alexa, if it um, can't be answered, then a sample of that was being sent to... Um, anonymously to humans who'd listen to it and try to think about why the algorithm couldn't answer it. 
and help tweak that algorithm. Now, the things that were being sent on, on the whole, are the edge cases. That means the things which are difficult to answer. And some of those difficult to answer things could be just accidentally triggered because you come in and say, Alex, and then you say something, you know, which is very private about Alex. Sure. And now it's gone off into the um, cloud to be listened to. I don't know who you are, but, you know, speech is a very special form, and we're doing it now, of communication. It isn't just a transaction. It's about your inner being. So this is being sent off and listened to. Now that has been exposed, if you like, and also companies have put their hands up that they do it. They were trying to do it for good reasons. You know, they're trying to improve the algorithms, but people are very um, uncomfortable with that. Uh, Amazon has responded actually very recently that um, you can, as a ordinary user, if you've got your Amazon app, you can not listen to, but you can find queries that people found hard, uh, the machine found hard to answer. And you can answer them with your voice and those things might get fed into the algorithm. So there's more of an honest, transparent conversation now happening saying that we do need human help. But before it wasn't obvious to the people sitting in homes and offices that they could be overheard. Companies, I believe, are trying to do good things. Of course, they need to make um, money. And if companies weren't making money, then to be frank, nothing would happen. Then we wouldn't get the innovations. All the people I've worked with, and I have worked with people, you know, full disclaimer, uh, in big companies, and those big companies are very supportive of, say, the, the center of doctoral training. Um, companies are abstract things. We work with the people in the research groups. And the people we work with are really, again, committed to trying to do wonderfully transformative technology, but ones that people will want to engage with and buy. It's in no one's interest to allow this darkness to settle for too long. I'm sure that's the case, but there are people who would probably say that whilst there's there are many, very many good actors within these companies, and these companies might, on the whole, be benign at the moment, what's to say in the future that they might be more sinister and they've actually got hold of lots of people's very sensitive data? personal data yeah and we've seen where those leaks have happened you know the kind of concern and uh, practical implications it is a really important question to be um raising uh it's really important that you know as consumers yeah you know, i guess you might have done what i've done you you buy a new thing then up pops a thing and says you read the terms and terms of service and you just say oh yeah. i accept those pop 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 they got a bit better now in the sense that you do have to scroll to the end. You know, it used to be the case that you could just tick it without even reading it. Yeah. But of course, even if you do read those things, you, you probably want some of these services. You, know, you want to use your, the email that's been provided or the social networking that you've been provided. Um, and I think we've got to have our eyes open when we use those things that it's like writing postcards and leaving them in the streets. I think there's a, a growing understanding of um, the concerns in terms of privacy these things bring, but also the, the ways you can interact with them. And I think, again, the younger people are perhaps a little bit more aware of that than uh, people who were hit mid-wave with some of this technology. If we could just take stock for a second and think about some of the very basic terms here. We've got um, AI, which mm -hmm. you mentioned a couple of times, which is artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. We've also got big data. Mm -hmm. uh, for people who might... They, they, they've heard these terms. They probably know broadly what they mean, but what mm. exactly are we talking about with, with these right. two things particularly? Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, these, these terms are used uh, very loosely you know, by all sorts, including me, uh, interchangeably. So let's just take AI. Um, sounds simple, doesn't it? Artificial and intelligence. Well, we sort of think we know what we mean by intelligence. Uh, you know, you've got it, I've got it. Hopefully people listening to this have got, got it. Uh, artificial, well, it sounds like, okay, it's not human, so it's some kind of um, constructed device. Mm. The reality is the intelligence that you and I have, machines are massively far from that. We have something called natural uh, intelligence. So we can deal with multiple situations uh, creatively, expressively, passionately, um, and adapt very quickly to all sorts of contexts. Artificial intelligence, as currently talked about in uh, you know, the media and by companies, is really machine learning. So machine learning is where you, let's take an example, facial recognition. 
I want to recognize a face, your face, and I've not um, seen you before. Uh, how would I do it? Well, with a machine, what I would do is by getting lots of pictures of lots of people, including yourself, I would uh, label them with your name and your background. And I would push all of that through in a, using a large amount, big data if you like, um, into a, a computer program. The computer program would start to learn distinguishing features uh, between your face and all of the other um, thousands or millions of faces that it sees. So then that's the training set. And when you come along and you stand in front of a device, it very quickly picks out the features which are important in faces like uh, around eyes, around nose, around mouth. And then it pushes it back into the algorithm and says, well, the best guess is this. Now that's far, that's quite a long way, isn't it? From, you know, being able to um, create a sonata or paint a money picture or have a conversation like we're having. So most of AI now, it's a hype word. It's being used by, well, academics for sure, uh, but by companies who want venture capitalist capitalism uh, in, uh, money, uh, by governments who want to say that they are doing new things in healthcare and transport. We just throw an AI at it. Um, it's, it it's much simpler than you would imagine. It also raises, you know, technology has always been used as a great utopian on the whole. Um, uh, kind of things will be better in the future because of, and the current because of is AI. So we think, you know, the economy will be better because of AI. Healthcare will be better because of AI. Mobility will be better because of AI. Growing older will be better. Now, the reality is, Growing old or finding your way around a town or building a new economy, these are very complex uh, endeavors and they require mass intelligence and community and, uh, if you like, societal engagement. Hoping that an algorithm, however smart, is going to um, sustainably, progressively, fairly move society on is what they would have called in Roman times bread and circuses. Mm. You know, it's mm. just a don't worry, we don't need to invest in all this. We'll just buy an app. You know, that slogan that says there's an app for everything, yeah, and you just need to go. Life's not like that, and we've got to be very careful as technologists that we we talk about what you can do positively with technology, but not try to blind people to the reality, which is often very complex and gritty and difficult and is not shiny like the back of your iPhone. And I can see how in, in the rise of all this, nothing is going to compensate for some of the basic tenets of humanity that, yeah. that we've been discussing. But is there still not a concern that, for example, big companies, governments will then have accrued a lot of information about us? That, because that's, that's irrelevant to the humanity point, isn't it? Um, yes, going back to my priest background, there's a... a a passage in the Bible that talks in Ecclesiastes of there being nothing new under the sun. And uh, that's from a positive point of view, that's true. You know, so the value, you know, people have wanted to be positive and connected and part of families forever. But people have also wanted to control and condemn and crucify people forever. So it's not a new problem. Uh, you know, people, you know, when Jesus was born, uh, what happened? There was a census. What was that? Big data. What was that big data for? Control and manipulation. And we've seen even in the last 100 years, of course, terrible use of technology. The very first um, kind of mass data processing, one example, was in the Holocaust. So the production of punch cards and systems like that was to gather data on um, communities not to amplify them, but to destroy them. So this is not a new problem. Uh, there's, a, there's, of course, now you know, quicker ways of doing it. Uh, in the past, you might have to cover up paper forms and type them in. Now people are carrying mobile phones, which have sensors, and, and people are willingly typing in all sorts of data. You know, every time you buy something, you show a preference. Every time you like something, you show a preference. So for sure... There is a lot of data that could be uh, used by malign actors, but it's the case they've always been malign actors. And so what we need to do is, like we're doing now, is to be aware of it, 
not to believe the technology is going to um, change that um, and to find ways of involving citizens in the construction of the interfaces that they have. So there have been companies who produce things which, for example, a search engine you use, you know, probably if you're like me, it's Google or maybe Microsoft's Bing. There is a, and you can opt out of various things, but on the whole, your searches will be tracked and used for advertising and, and stored. Uh, and a profile of you will be built up. But you could download another browser, uh, a search engine called DuckDuckGo. And that is explicitly not tracking your search terms uh, and is not trying to build a profile. So there's an example of how a company and organization is responding to concerns and shaping technology. And I think we'll see much more of that in the next uh, five to 10 years. I suppose a much cruder way of asking that question, uh, or a different way of asking it, is are the robots coming? And are they going to take my job? <laughs> Mine in particular, perhaps, or, well, or, yeah, or, or yeah. mine just broadly yeah, from yeah, other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess like you, uh, like me, you do several types of job. Um, if you're thinking about jobs which are going to look through um, texts and find connections and, if you like, find sources which might be useful, yes, that, some elements of that could go. But making sense of those texts, um, I don't think so. I'm doing this kind of thing, I don't think so. Um I've been thinking recently about that, you know, you know, the robotic future. And I think, again, it's a distraction to, to worry too much about, you know, these kind of oh, sort of uh, futuristic sci-fi sort of images or even like a Frankenstein view of a technology that is rising up and will take over from us. I think actually we're becoming the robots, um, I think, and that's much more um, now and is much more concerning. Um, you know, how many times a day do you, um, you just did it, looked at your mobile phone all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you click and your head is down. You are feeding a, a machine, every click, every swipe, every interaction. And my concern is that we are, we are losing elements of our empathy or connection through those mobile devices. So my work is about trying to, um, reinvigorate design. So it, um, gets people's heads up. Um, doesn't um, take away from the, the use or the value of, say, mobile devices. But when I was a kid, I was, used to get scared by um, cyber men on Doctor Who. Uh, well, I was scared by all of Doctor Who, particularly cyber men. And I think the most terrifying thing then was this notion that you, you've got a human, and then bit by bit, they were encased in metal. And then the very last bit was when they ripped out the emotional center of the cyber man being and a small tear dropped from the eye of this metal mask at that point. Now, a question I'd give to you and to anyone listening to this, you know, uh, to what extent have you, have you become encased in a, a sort of mechanistic future and click by click, how far off are you from losing that empathy? And I just say, um, take heed. Yeah. You know, don't get encased. No, I worry about symptoms. In my defense, I was checking the time on my phone a second ago, not, oh, right, to, right, not right, anything right. more, just to see how we're doing. Right. But is there, are there things that people do you know, with their phones or on their laptops that are better than other things? Or to turn that question around, are there particular activities that people do that worry you in terms of them distancing themselves from society? Um, I don't think, you know, I wouldn't, I'd, I'd, I'd hate to pronounce on you know, what kind of apps or what kind of activities are all very different, you know, so some people will, um, read books on their, um, uh, phone. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? It's a parent discussing it. So my, my kids, um, uh, Rosie, who's the, uh, our, um, youngest, uh, she's now 16. She reads a lot of books, physical books, um, almost obsessively. And then as Sam, Sam knows a bit older, but when he was about, um, 16 he was playing a lot of clash of clans on his phone and so i think i must have been going through one of my um diatribes about technology <laughs> uh, yeah my kids suffer for for <laughs> for my art and i said sadly you spent two hours on that device you know why aren't you kind of doing something more active and he pointed to to rosie and she said well she's been three hours reading that um jane austen book what's the difference now there is a difference because what a book does is it takes you into a world of imagination 
It's also very um, focused in the sense that you move page by page and you engage. What you have with lots of digital interactions is, and I do this, you know, you get home and you look at Twitter and then that's two seconds and then I'll flip to a Guardian online and flip to the after. Then I'm doing email. It's, it's very, very um, addictive. Uh, it's like pulling a, uh, one of these um, one-armed bandits. Will I get an email saying, come and talk to Sam on a part? You know, yeah, I've got something exciting to do on Friday. Yeah, or will I get something else? You know, who knows? A special offer, I don't know. Um, and I think that's the danger where you get sucked away down the rabbit hole, not of a book written by uh, Lewis Carroll, but of a careful creation of technology. Um, I forgot your original question, but it must no, have, I think you must I think have come answer. must have come from there somewhere. No, you've you've completely answered it. And I think, yeah, it's about making that relative judgment, isn't it, between yeah, reading the novel or just flicking through a Instagram feed or something. Yeah. And 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 it is then, I suppose, the human's judgment yeah. to, to. I mean, to I'll give you an analogy if you like. So, um, I guess we both like food um, too much. Yeah, exactly. And and you can go out uh, for a meal. Went out last night. It was um, Ben's, my middle son's 18th birthday yesterday. Uh, so we went out to a lovely Italian restaurant and you start eating and it's lovely food. You eat more, you eat more, and you eat more. What happens when, that, when you do that? Uh, you get bloated and full. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you get signals, don't you, from your body. Yeah. Or in the summer, perhaps people listening to this uh, were lucky enough to be in Swansea, which is a, a wonderfully sunny place occasionally. Uh, and you know, we had a heat wave. Yeah. So Sam's looking behind himself and then seeing a possible rain. The driving rain. But it is you know, autumn now. Uh, if you lie on the beach during the, one of the amazing events we have in Swansea, like the, uh, the air show. Uh, and if you stay there, you'll get hot and you get hotter and then you'll burn. So your body is giving you feedback to change. Now what we need are, if, how would we design that in terms of our interactions with the say, mobile devices? Um, how could you get a sense that you are bloated in your consumption of social media? Now, companies, to be fair, like um, Google and Apple, um, over the last two years have been addressing this or starting to address it with some of their well-being um, bits of their operating system. So if you haven't tried this and you've got a Google phone, an Android phone, you can drill down and find settings called, I think it's called um, well-being. And you can do things like... Um, uh, as it comes up towards the normal time you go to bed, it's got a, a facility called wind down. So it starts to go um, a bit dimmer. It stops you interacting. Or you can look on Apple to see how many, and it is eye-opening if you haven't done it. You've got an Apple phone. Now, how many times have you opened your phone? How many t hours have you spent on email? And I think that's a very positive thing by companies to get people to reflect. And like all behavior, you know, I'm certainly not advocating going in and saying, no, this is bad for you. You should not do it. You know, if the world was like that, we'd be in a world where just one person's view mattered. But we do need to give people um, the ability to reflect on their behavior. And we do it in many other spheres, don't we? So I think that's the way I would hope things would go, that people are made more aware of the choices that they're making, reflect on them. They might well want to carry on doing it. You know, um, people like drinking, even though they know that drinking too much is bad for them. That's fine. But at least they know it's bad for them. And I think we need a similar thing with some elements of digital interaction. It's probably quite telling that I've chosen to angle this conversation towards the negatives <laughs> and the drawbacks of all of this sort of stuff initially. But obviously there are many positives to all of this. And if you were to identify one or two of, of the greatest positives of all this technological advance, what would they be? That's a really interesting question. Um, I think, I mean, I focus a lot thinking about, as you say, um, some of the downsides. But I've worked, as we um, uh, talked earlier, with communities who are getting their hands on technology for the first time. So I haven't been exposed to all of the different influences that we've had. And there is a, uh, a real excitement there of new opportunities in terms of education, for example. Let me go um, back to um, those smart speakers 
Um, I can hear something in my headphones. I think it might be that rain you mentioned. Is that Swansea rain, rain, not rain possible? potentially? Is that rain? Maybe. Goodness me, an unusual thing for those who've not visited Swansea. <laughs> uh, and in fact, and the, the informal slum I was in in Darabia was talking about is monsoon time. So this rain, if it is rain, is nothing. Um, go back to, to Darabia again, and I'll tell you a story about uh, how technology transform things there so we were inspired by a project called hole in the wall computing and it was literally that um a researcher uh, indian researcher probably about 20 25 years ago knocked holes in the wall um around his university his university um was adjacent to a, a slum and he put in uh, just standard computers of that time uh with keyboards and screens and then uh, lots of kids clustered around that, kids who'd never seen computers before, and were able to engage with that technology, learn how to use that technology, and be inspired by that technology. So I think, you know, technology um, does empower people. It gives people connections. Uh, it has helped a lot of people who are um, feeling lonely and um, isolated. It's amazing, you know, people say that technology is for kids, and it is, but a lot of older people have um, through FaceTime, through Skype, connected with their friends and family and felt less socially isolated when they can't get out of the house. There are many, many positive things that technology can do. Uh, I think what I want to do is to ensure that when we build those things, we have our eyes open to ensuring that this technology sitting in front of me, you as a human, that is the focus of the development rather than just a piece of another gadget or another service uh, particularly as we go into this world where we're worrying about sustainability and we're worrying about, you know, all of these devices use up a huge amount of resources, not just power. So just thinking about what we need and how we can deploy them for the social good. Uh, you've spoken about Mumbai a couple of times. What's been your most rewarding thing that you've done in terms of working overseas with other people and technologies? Is it that stuff? Um, India and Mumbai has been really good, but we've also worked, um, up in the mountains in India and in, uh, 15 years ago now in rural villages around, um, Bangalore and seeing the contrast between, you know, even then 15 years ago, Bangalore was a technological innovation center in India and we were out just two hours from there. Uh, it felt like you were going back completely in time to a very agrarian and rural context. Um, then in the townships of South Africa in Cape Town, uh, working alongside um, entrepreneurs and working alongside just ordinary community members to get their perspective on technology. I think for in all of those situations, I mean, I can think about systems that those communities have helped develop and inform where I feel the research results have been fantastic. And that's, that's great. The most rewarding thing, I think, is being allowed into the lives of those communities to see with very different eyes uh, their aspirations, but also, if you get something like your mobile phone, you flip it over, it says designed in California most of the time, yeah? Uh, and that's not to condemn California. We are all, even in this reign of Swansea, Californian. We have a particular mindset about the future uh, and about technology. The most rewarding thing for me is to go to places and to see what the world, if it was designed in Daravi or designed in Langer in South Africa or up in Missouri in the hills of um, India, what would our world be like if we had a much more inclusive conversation about the future? Uh, and I, I think the reward I've seen is it would be a better place. You know, right now, the world, forget about the digital falling into darkness, the world is in turbulent times. Uh, there are lots of different political views and there are lots of views on what is uh, the right way to do things and who are the right people to do it. I think what I've learned uh, from my work is the more people you have involved in future making, the more perspectives you have in future making, you need those eyes, those hearts, those hands. If you exclude anyone, you have two things happen. One is you exclude people. And that is clearly bad. And the other is, you don't get a diversity of innovation and creativity. And that's why, for example, in you know, my field of computer science, we really worked hard and we need to do much more 
to encourage you know a much wider participation in um shaping and making futures uh we haven't done very well in that diversity and we need to do well for everyone's sake it's not a easy challenge i guess either is it and i as, as you've been speaking i suppose i've just been trying to formulate a question which is that the kind of people who might engage with you about this and people who for example would program their mm. their phone to yeah. tell them how often they're using it might not be the kind of people who actually need to get off their phones <laughs> Yes, that's right. Uh, you know, self. If you are interested in reflective on um, uh, what you're doing, then it's a bit like people who go jogging or go swimming and cycling. Uh, they might worry about it and might look at their step counters and uh, feel good or feel that they should go out more. But how do you get across to people who perhaps are unaware that there is a problem in their activity? Uh, so we do, you know, as part of our work. Uh, it's not simply about innovation, is we do events where we um, go to many different places to to talk to people about, well, you know, do they see this problem? Some people look at you, you know, it's like someone who is drinking three bottles of wine. You say, do you think you've got a problem? And they go, no, I really enjoy it. And we have the same thing when we go out and talk about, you know, habits of use and possibilities of technology. But I think you have to go out there and you have to engage people uh, in that conversation. Um I am really passionate too about ensuring that everybody gets uh, an insight into how they might be able to shape and understand digital technology. And at Swansea, I'm really proud that we have um, uh, organizations like Technocamps that goes out uh, into schools across Wales and is not trying to convert everyone to become you know, massively digitally literate or massively, but you can't have the whole world being computer scientists. You know, that would be really bad, probably. Uh, but we do need everybody to have a say about what future is being made for them. Uh, and at the moment, you know, it's, it's limited. The voices are limited. If you look at people who are involved in computer science in terms of development, design of systems, it's overwhelmingly male. Uh, nothing wrong with men. I know lots of them. I am one. However, like everything, if you only have half the world shaping the future and that's what digital is it's like the architecture but now of the future then you're going to have places and spaces that don't meet and don't have the creativity of the other half of the world and gender is just one aspect you know outlook faith perspective we need as many hearts and hands into this future making as possible which leads me on to one of my final questions which is how do you see the future panning out you know the next 20 years what's what is technology going to bring and how does your or how would you like your research to tie into that oh i'm a great believer that the best is yet to come in terms of um what we can do as um, a connected society that understands and shapes the future i think there's some really big debates happening right now across the world uh we talked about one of them in terms of technology uh, and almost like a backlash that uh, people are, are seeing, you know, both at a government level and a society level about data and big data and the use. But also there's a big debate going on about, you know, what is a open and honest and connected world? Should we be protectionist? Should we be global? I'm very glad that we're having those conversations and I'm glad that there is um, passionate debate about it. I think what we will see is that technology the best thing technology can do is to give us a lens and a light into different people's lives and perspectives. And by doing that, we can see the most exciting, the most wonderful, the most diverse and challenging future is in the technology that's sitting right around everyone all the time, which is themselves. And that is very positive, I think, because when people connect back and realize that, you know, we've been given a life. Uh, it isn't very long. Uh, and you say, what's it going to be like in 20 years? In 20 years' time, I will be 72. I might be dead. Uh, for me, as a Christian, that's okay. It's just the start. Um, but let's have our eyes open to realizing that it's not the technology that's the most important thing. It is humankind. And everything we do as computer scientists, digital innovators, should be amplifying that. And I think there is a lot of drive in companies in countries and in places like the computational foundry to push that uh, not agenda but opportunity 
You know, we're scientists, we present data, we present findings, and then it is for government and it's for everyday citizens to make of it what they will. But I'm very hopeful about the future. Having this conversation, uh, and maybe it's just the nature of this podcast, but it feels, and this is meant to be a, wholly as a compliment, it almost feels like I'm talking to a philosopher more than a scientist or a computer scientist. Has anybody ever made that kind of observation to you before? Uh, in less polite terms, yes, for sure. Yeah, indeed. Um, <laughs> I think it was very interesting. I mean, because you know, obviously, I'm in the world of science. I'm, I, you know, I'm a fortune here to to head up the College of Science. So I, I'm immersed by scientists. When I go out of the university, most people, when I say I'm head of science, they haven't walked away before the last syllable. <laughs> <laughs> as a surprise, because I think, and quite rightly, there's a perception out there um, of all scientists um, being um, almost robotic. You know, white coats, we process data and we give results. And particularly computer scientists, you know, there's, you know, if you close your eyes now and I say the word computer scientist, there's a particular image probably that comes up. G geeky, I would exactly, say. Exactly, exactly. So I would just like to say that, you know, my experience of working with scientists across the world and with computer scientists in particular is, guess what? They're humans and they have the same failings and failures as anyone else in any other profession, but they're also driven to um, learn, explore and express and then connect with their fellow citizens. So I'd encourage people who, uh, you know, who haven't gone along to a science lab or to a university it's sometimes very daunting, you know, and, I, and I've been to big uh, research institutions, even when I'm a professor, and you kind of look at them, you, know, you walk up to MIT, I was there um, uh, six months ago, perhaps a bit longer, you think, oh, you know, you've heard so much about the place, and it's impressive, and it's shiny, and there's glass, and there are professors in there. Look, try to just um, overcome that, knock on the door, come to open days, go to visit days, you'll find that it's full of interesting, sometimes eccentric, humans. And that's the most important technology of all. And would that be your advice to somebody perhaps listening to this who's thinking about their future career? Oh, of course. I mean, I mean, the first advice I give to anyone thinking about future career is be hopeful. Uh, uh, you're at, if you are just at the start of thinking about your career, what a great thing, uh, what a great opportunity you have. Uh, often kind of and also be flexible. Remember, as I said at the start of this podcast, I was convinced as I, and I wrote at the end of my PhD, I said, this is the last piece of academic work I'm going to do because I was going to become a priest, right? Now, some of my research colleagues will say that's true. That's the last decent bit of academic work you did. And that was 30 years ago. Um, I believed I was going to be a priest, probably now sitting in a small parish in Wales, surrounded by a flock of sheep, uh, writing sermons for the weekend. And I'm sitting in Swansea University talking to, to Sam about technology. And I don't know what will happen in the future. So the first bit of advice, be hopeful. Second bit of advice, be flexible. Third, come and see. Come and see. The universities that I've gone to, the colleges, the FE colleges, they're full of people that are passionate about developing you. They're passionate about the future of society. They're great places to be. And don't be daunted by, they look, they look serious. I'm going to do a very final quick fire one. Um, when you're out at dinner, do you ever check your phone? And secondly, when you're in the supermarket, do you ever use the self-service checkouts? Um, I don't go to supermarkets. Uh, okay. And uh, when I'm out at dinner, do I check my phone? Um, this is a hostage to fortune, isn't it? Because someone, I gave a, a big talk to, on just this. And then immediately after the talk, I had to look at my email and someone tweeted a picture of it. And that wasn't very good. Um, I was out last night and I didn't check my phone. Great. We're going to have to wrap it up. But Matt, thank you very much. That was fascinating. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about Professor Matt James's work, then visit swansea.ac.uk forward slash science forward slash cherish dash DE. To find out more about this podcast and Swansea University's research, visit swansea.ac.uk forward slash research. That's all for this episode. Thanks for listening. And thank you again to our guest, Professor Matt Jones. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate and review. I'm Sam Blaxland, and that was Exploring Global Problems from Swansea University.